Last week, we looked at Abram's first encounter with God and the promise of land and countless heirs. Abram trusted God and set out to go where God led him and his household. There were many adventures along the way. First, famine comes across the land, and Abram and his company flee to Egypt for survival. There in Egypt, he passes Sarai, Sarai, his wife, off as his sister because she is beautiful and he fears men there will kill him so that they might have her. The Pharaoh takes a shine to her and takes her into his palace. Abram grows rich, benefiting from his wife's favor with the ruler. But God is not pleased and brings plagues upon Egypt. Pharaoh eventually realizes what Abram has done and throws them and all of their possessions out, and they continue to wander, seeking the promised land and progeny. Abram and Lot's households had grown very wealthy with silver, gold, and livestock. Soon conflicts broke out because the herders of the livestock felt the land couldn't sufficiently support both owners' animals. Abram and Lot go their separate way, with Lot heading to the lush and fertile land of Sodom. However, war breaks out, and Lot, that's Abram's nephew, is taken prisoner. Abram becomes a hero, rescuing Lot and all of his possessions. So we're beginning to see that God has chosen to work in and through one who is so like us, He is basically a mixture of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Abram is human in every way. Throughout these happenings, God checks in occasionally and reminds Abram of the promises that were made. Needless to say, Abram is beginning to get a bit skeptical. He doesn't yet possess the land. He has no heirs. In fact, it seems that he's beginning to think about who will inherit his wealth since he is growing older. He bemoans to God that all of it will fall to a slave in his household. But God assures him once again that God will keep the promise. Sarai, too, is discouraged. She's grown weary of waiting on God to come through on this promise. So she takes matters into her own hands. She gives her hand servant Hagar to Abram so that he may at last sire a child. And Hagar, Hagar gives birth to a son, Ishmael. Finally, a child to carry on Abram's lineage and God's promise. But no, this is not what God had intended. This is not how the covenant with Abraham will be fulfilled to create the people Israel. Instead, Ishmael goes on to become the progenitor of Islam and the Muslim people. So today we encounter God reminding a 99-year-old Abram of that promise made 24 years ago. We can only imagine how he must have felt after all that time, waiting on the Lord, waiting for his dream to be fulfilled. His life changed in ways only God can make happen. 24 years, yet Abram remains committed to doing as God asks of him. Maybe he thinks he thinks things will happen in some way other than what he had imagined. Maybe he had misunderstood exactly how he would become the father of a nation more numerous than stars in the sky. But he and Sarah continue in their relationship with God and in their relationship with one another. And so today we read that God appears to Abram to renew the promise of that covenant. There are added elements, a freshness to that covenant made all those years ago. God calls the Holy One by the name El Shaddai, meaning God Almighty, the first time this name is used in Scripture. And Abram is given a new name. Abram, meaning exalted father, becomes Abraham, father of a multitude. God will be his God and the God of the people being created through him. And Sarai... Sarai will be the woman through whom these heirs will come. And her name is changed as well, from Sarai to Sarah. The names don't seem to have much difference in meaning. The important thing is that God makes explicit that Abraham will be the father of great nations and Sarah will be the mother. This is something new. 
Sarah is made a co-participant in the divine promise. She has a promise of her own, not simply sharing the one made to Abraham. Sarah will eventually give birth to a son of her own womb, a son named Isaac. But what must the recipients of this promise do? Is this covenant somehow conditional? No. God has made this promise and vowed to keep it, whatever Abraham, Sarah, and their descendants end up doing. But God does ask two things of them. First, they are to be trustworthy, blameless, as some translations put it. Does that mean that they must be perfect without sin? No. What God expects of them and what God expects of us is faithfulness. We are expected to remain in relationship with God. God knows we are sinful creatures who live in a broken world. Our job is to keep trying to live into the life God intends for us, a life of faithful love and service to the one who loves us always and unconditionally. But there's an interesting command given. Circumcise the males. When we talked about the covenant with Noah, we talked about God hanging up the bow to remind us of his promise. The rainbow was to serve as a reminder to God of this covenant into which God had entered. Perhaps similarly, this alteration to men's bodies will remind God's people of who they are and whose they are and the responsibility they have to remain faithful to the one true God. Basically, God asks of them that they prove that they too have skin in the game, pun intended. Through Christ, we are no longer asked to give of our own skin, for Jesus gave his, along with the rest of his body, so that we might enter into a new covenant. But I do think God still asks each of us, what will you offer this relationship? What are you willing to give? Will we give our time, our talent, when we join the church, we promise to support it with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. And speaking of witness, we still have those cards on the back table. Take them, use them to share your faith with others. Are we doing that? Do we have skin in the game? Are we actually taking part, getting involved in the everyday life of the church? Research on religion today tells us that things have changed dramatically. A large number of people now regard regular worship attendance to be once a month. Many experience church through the internet. Giving to the church is not as important as it once was, and many young people don't carry cash or checks. People are very aware of a church's involvement in the community. They want to see how we're loving our neighbors. As a congregation, we need to be thinking about these trends and figuring out how to move into a future that God sees and we may not yet see. Abraham trusted God. He laughed when God told him what would happen. Was it disbelief or was it joy? Whatever it was, Abraham did what God asked. In the end, Abraham was faithful. Will we be? Thanks be to God. Amen.